So today we're going to talk about Shtequing, a uh, Squalum village at Washington Harbor here on Squim Bay. Um, actually, uh, this is the closest village site to the uh, Jamestown Tribal Campus in Blinn today. So um, just a couple of the sources uh, for my research on this project um, included some of the, uh, the older material, ethnographical material from Gibbs, Wilkes, um, the treaty signing expedition, Myron Eels, um, and I'm going to talk about these folks later. And then we've got, uh, I've got some more contemporary archaeological data from uh, more recent excavations that have occurred out at this site over the last 20, 30 years that I'm going to touch on. Um, and then finish up by talking about some additional archaeological survey work we did at this village site uh, two years ago and what we found uh, as a result of those excavations. Uh, so this map gives you an idea of sort of the, the general spread of Squalum village sites on sort of the Salish Sea, Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, you can see that there's a village site over at Beecher Bay, over on Vancouver Island, uh, on the other side of what's now the international border. Um, and then you can see Nuxquite, the uh, village at Port Gamble, down there at the entrance to Hood Canal. Uh, but for the most part, the, the core of Squalum villages were spread out along the north coast of the Olympic Peninsula. Um, the village that we're going to be talking about today is marked on this map with the big orange orange star, Shchukwing. And this next map gives you a little bit better idea. So the, the village that we're talking about is where the red number six is, um, where uh, Battelle Marine Science Laboratory stands today uh, there at the head of Squim Bay. Um, and then we're going to talk about a few of these other associated sites that were in uh, close vicinity to the village. Um, we're going to start with a little bit of a timeline. So uh, the oldest documented archaeological evidence that we have uh, for Native Americans in the Squim area is the Manus Mastodon site. Uh, so 11,800 years before the Common Era, roughly uh, 14,000 years ago, the Manus Mastodon was butchered in Happy Valley, about two miles south of Squim. Uh, there's actually a, a couple different pieces of evidence for that Mastodon having been uh, butchered by humans. Um, the most famous piece of evidence is the bone point that's lodged in the mastodon's ribs. And, and using bone points was a, was a, a pretty common technology um, going back uh, to those hunting traditions. Um, but then also the, the, the actual cranium, the occipital lobe of the mastodon was rotated 180 degrees and smashed into pieces. Um, and that's something that we typically see at uh, Holocene kill sites. Um, what uh, people were doing was actually cracking open that brain case to get the very calorie-rich brain matter out of there. Uh, and that's something that we don't really see many wild animals doing. So that's usually seen as uh, evidence of human uh, harvesting or butchering of an animal. Um, they also found uh, at least one chipped stone tool there. And then sequentially in uh, more recent deposits on top of the Manus Mastodon, were uh, bison antiquus and caribou uh, kills, hunting kills. So we had a hunting camp there on the edge of that pond um, that was occupied for at least a couple thousand years, um, from 14,000 years ago through, um, at least through the Mazama eruption, uh, Mount Mazama or Crater Lake in Oregon erupted roughly six and a half, seven thousand 7,000 years ago uh, and left a layer of ash throughout the Pacific Northwest that we can use to date archeological sites. And the Manus site was used before and after that eruption. Um, coming up to a bit more recently, uh, the Squim Bypass site has an Olcott opponent, which I'll talk about uh, towards the end of this presentation, um, that's, that's somewhere between three to 8,000 years old. Um, the site is characterized by stone tools, so we can't get radiocarbon dates from the stone tools. We have to infer dates of that site based on radiocarbon dates at other archaeological sites where there are similar stone tools, um, which is why you get such a wide range of date. Uh, but we do know that uh, people were actively living, hunting, and camping on the Squim Prairie for at least the last seven to 8,000 years. Um, the most intensive utilization of the Squim Prairie started roughly about 3,000 years ago, um, and the most radiocarbon, most recent radiocarbon date that they got during the Squim Bypass excavations was about 170 years ago, um, which you know per basically perfectly coincides with the arrival arrival of non-natives and the settlement of Squim Prairie and development of the Squim Prairie um, for agricultural uses. So those hunting traditions stop at that point. 
Uh, the earliest radiocarbon date from archaeological site 45CA227, and that's the site trinomial designation for the Shikwing village site. So once it quit being a village site, uh, it, it was then recorded as an archaeological site by archaeologists. Um, in archaeology, sites are given a trinomial uh, uh, to record the site, so that's what 45CA227 is. It's the 227th archaeological site recorded in Clallam County. Um, the earliest radiocarbon from radiocarbon date from that site uh, was roughly about 650 years before present. And so uh, what we think is, you know, that was probably one of the earliest occupations of this site and that sequentially over time, as people were living and camping and cooking along this beach, they built up the shell midden, which I'll talk about later, um, became this large berm and the village was built on top of that. Um, we also know from radiocarbon dating that there is a, a period of occupation at Pitchet Point just south of Shaquing, so where the John Wayne Marina is today. Um, that was another large former village site that was occupied just prior to this, the Shaquing village site. Um, and so there's probably some relation between these two village sites, and there's a good chance that people shifted from the Pitchet Point village site, uh, which we know from uh, geotechnical work was subjected to local subsidence events there in that corner of Squim Bay um, and moved the village site to where Chiquing was. In 1790, Manuel Quimper was a Spanish explorer. Uh, he sailed into Dungeness and Discovery Bays. Uh, he actually buried a cross somewhere in the area of Grays Marsh and claimed um, this area for Spain. Two years later, George Vancouver also sailed into Dungeness and Discovery Bays. Um, and at that point, Vancouver notes um, very strong evidence of uh, widespread epidemics. He found human remains um, scattered in abandoned village sites. Um, and he also noted that the, the Sklalem inhabitants of Dungeness and Discovery Bays were totally indifferent to the European ships. And uh, Vancouver's guys were actually hopping in their little rowboats and trying to paddle around Squim Bay and shoot the waterfowl, the ducks which were just flying, and they noted that, you know, the whole time that they were rowing around Squim Bay and shooting at ducks, uh, the inhabitants of Squim Bay seemed to view us with the utmost indifference and unconcern. Um, so that's probably good evidence that by, by even by that early on, um, the Squalum had had a, a, a great deal of interaction with um, European explorers. Uh, one of the constants was they would always go out and trade deer and elk meat to uh, these European ships uh, who were very grateful for a, a supply of fresh red meat. So um, we've got a lot of really great early documented encounters between European explorers and the Squalum um, hunters and fishermen who were bringing them out uh, goods for trading. In 1844, we see the earliest representation of the village site on a map uh, by Captain Charles Wilkes who visited with the U.S. Exploring Expedition. And you can see that in the inset. Uh, basically, what he mapped was uh, the longer, what was actually an extended uh, superstructure of 10 longhouses. He mapped as one big longhouse with sort of two small shacks on each side of it. Um, and those are probably representing the, the slave village that was adjacent to uh, the larger Squalum village. Uh, so in 1851 was when the first non-natives arrived around the, the Dungeness prairies. They're just south of Kleinspit and Dungeness Bay and began forming a Euro-American uh, agricultural farming settlement. Uh, you had a lot of uh, conflict early on from that, f right from that point, because uh, these non-natives were settling on prairies, which the tribes used for their traditional gathering of camas. Uh, tiger lilies, fern roots, and other plants that they were dependent on for their survival. Um, by this point, by the 1840s, 1850s, um, these villages where the women would manage their uh, their camas patches also had large potato patches. Uh, potatoes were introduced up the coast by Spanish explorers. Once the Coast Salish tribes had access to potatoes, um, they, they immediately started planting those and harvesting them on their prairies because you use a very similar um, agricultural technique to grow potatoes that you do to camas. Um, and it's a very low maintenance, uh, a relatively low maintenance form of agriculture. 
However, when the first non-natives showed up and saw these prairies with these nice camas and potato patches and built their log cabins on them, then the tribes would show up a couple months later to do their traditional harvest, and so you had a source of conflict um, right there off the, the bat. Um, and so that, as the non-native uh, population increased, those conflicts increased. In 1855, the Squalum, along with the Tuana and Chemicum, signed the Treaty of Point No Point um, over at Hansville, near where uh, the Port Gamble Squalum tribe is located today. Uh, the... Uh, oh, what the government wanted to do after the signing of the treaty was move the Squalum people to the Skokomish Reservation down at the head of Hood Canal. Um, the Squalum people never went. A, a few individuals went down for a few days, uh, got down there, saw that what the proposed Skokomish Reservation was a giant swamp. Um, there, was, there was literally no livable area, um, and it would have been impossible for the Squalum people to continue hunting and fishing in their traditional, um, usual, and accustomed territories from the head of Hood Canal. Um, you can't reach your, your, uh, your fishing banks and your clam gathering areas. Um, so the, the Squalum never left, the Squalum never went to Skokomish. Uh, in 1870, the final potlatch was held at Shikwing, and we have a really great um, record of this account by Edward Curtis. Uh, the following year in 1871, a ship called the What Cheer uh, arrived from San Francisco. The, uh, crew was infected with smallpox. As the ship drifted down uh, into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, they were discarding um, both uh, infected uh, bodies, d uh, cadavers, and clothing items overboard. Those washed ashore, and some of the tribal folks picked up some of the clothing, were infected with smallpox. Um, and this was, this was either the third or fourth um, very serious epidemic that came through within the span of 200 years. And the epidemic that hit between roughly 1861 and 1871 um, was what caused the most precipitous population decline within the, the Squalum people. Um, in 1874, a group of uh, 17 Squalum families under the leadership of their uh, hereditary chief, James Balch, pulled together $500 in gold coin and bought uh, 210 acres of land that became the Jamestown uh, settlement uh, and essentially created their own village site there. Those lots were apportioned by how much each family contributed. And each lot, uh, they all run long uh, in the long perpendicular lots from the shore because each family required beach frontage to pull their canoes up so they can continue their traditional uh fishing and uh, subsistence lifeways. The map on the right side you can see is from an 1870 uh, U.S. Coast Survey T-sheet, and what I've highlighted in red is, is the actual superstructure of the village that was 10 connected longhouses, and then you can see, and I've highlighted in blue right behind that, was a small pond that was fed from a seep or a spring that came out of the bluff behind the village, so you had a source of fresh water, the Washington Harbor Lagoon just to the north, and then uh, what's called the Middle Ground, which is a large uh, tidal bank that you can see sort of outlined in the bottom right part of this map are two incredibly rich uh, shellfish banks that uh, the people from this village would have used. Um, and then a uh, great deal of other resources that I'll talk about in a couple slides. Uh, one of the really... Uh, cool things about this village is we have this sketch that was from a uh, Seattle area newspaper in the 1840s showing what the village looked like at that time. Um, then eth ethnographer Erna Gunther, who worked for the University of Washington Anthropology Department for a very long time, she came out in the 1920s and interviewed Jamestown Squalum uh, elders about what their memories of traditional life was like in the villages in the 1880s, um, essentially right before or right around when all of these families um, packed up and moved and settled at Jamestown. Uh, and one of, one of the really great accounts that we have is who lived in each of the 10 houses in this village site. Um, we then know uh, for example, house number two, house of Wanasumek and John the Doctor. Um, John the Doctor was the grandfather of Robert Collier, and so the Collier family from the Jamestown tribe today are descended from John the Doctor. Um, you can see number seven, house of Skyak Squim Dick. Uh, 
uh, the Jamestown family, Dick family, today are des descended from Swim Dick. So we were able to actually go out there on site during site visits and give people roughly an idea of where their great, great, great grandparents lived at this village, um, which is a really fun experience to do. Uh, you can see from this sketch that the village itself was protected by a palisade. Uh, and this was pretty common for most Coast Salish and, and definitely almost all slalom villages by the 1830s, 1840s. Um, there was a great deal of intertribal warfare, especially with tribes um, from farther to the north in British Columbia uh, who were raiding down into the Salish Sea and Puget Sound on slave raids. Um, so this village was defended by a, a split uh, cedar punch in palisade and uh, one of the really interesting things is in terms of the the physical fabric of the village there's still a few of those palisade logs out there that I'll show you photos of in a few minutes um, that's sort of the last physical fabric of the village that's out there but it's pretty cool um, you can see from this map on the left side of the screen uh, 1940 Clallam County tax assessor map uh, Hans Buggy purchased the property in 1899, began, uh, there was already a small clam cannery on the site. He began to develop that clam cannery. He built a small uh, apartment workers housing for uh, Squala men working at the clam cannery. And then you can see the, the village itself. Uh, quite a few of the families from the village actually moved out to the end of Travis Spit. You can see highlighted out there in Keapop Point. Um, and those, some of those structures were there through the 1850s, 1860s, and we have some photographs of what those structures looked like. Um, by 1907 is when the site, the, the former village site, was first recorded as an archaeological site. So you can see there roughly from uh, the passing on of the last chief, Zalskanum, in 1855, Hans Buggy purchasing the property in 1899, and then by 1907, um, essentially the fabric, the physical fabric of the village is gone, and it's, it's recorded as an archaeological site. Uh, these images are from the Clallam County Historical Society, and on the bottom left, uh, the photo on the bottom left, you can actually see some of those structures in that village that was out there on the end of the spit. Um, I believe that photo is taken sometime in the 1920s or 30s. Uh, the photo on the upper right is the workers' housing where the uh, Squalum workers lived who were working at the Buggy Clam Cannery. Um, and just about any tribal elder today can, t can list off, you know, either their parents or their aunties or their uncles or their grandparents who worked at the Clam Cannery um, either year-round or seasonally. Um, this was a hugely important source of income for many of the Jamestown Squalum through the 19th century. Uh, so the photo on the upper right hand side of the screen, uh, upper right corner, you can see those are the last of the longhouse structures out there on Travis Spit uh, as they looked in 1950, just prior to them being demolished. Um, and then the photo on the top left again is showing you what those looked like, uh, in a, a broader panorama view out there on the spit. In 1866, the property was so sold to Battelle Northwest for the construction of a marine research laboratory. In 1972, the village site was listed on the Washington Heritage Register. In 1980-81, Battelle went out there and uh, basically did a bunch of construction in the middle of the archaeological site, trenched through it, um, and caused a lot of destruction to the archaeological site. A uh, whistleblower uh, notified the Port Campbell and Jamestown tribes of what was happening. Uh, work was halted and Battelle hired uh, archaeologist Estrito Nat to come in and do uh, basically salvage uh, recovery excavations on the material that had been trenched out of the site. Uh, in 1981, the, her screening produced over 6,500 artifacts, which the Jamestown tribe now curates. In 2006, Jamestown Squalum tribal elder Kathy Duncan repatriated 390 sets of human remains and 28 associated funerary objects from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, many of those human remains came from Shtequing and the uh, cemetery associated with this village site. Uh, 2015, there were additional excavations um, on buggy spit, shouldn't say travel spit, uh, which revealed additional evidence of food preparation and processing of large an mammals, specifically elk. In 2017, there were uh, emergency repairs of the water line that was put in in 1980, which was the cause of the initial 
um, archaeological salvage recovery. The image that you see in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, uh, you see that very dark black organic looking soil. That's intact shell midden. So um, when I when I use the term shell midden, midden is a term uh, applied to sort of any any pile of refuse or rubbish. You know, a, a pack rat has a midden where it packs things away. Um, archaeologists use the term midden to apply to anywhere that humans were historically depositing um, rubbish or discarded food materials, that sort of thing. Here in the Pacific Northwest, um, where you have uh, Coast Salish cultures that are very uh, specifically oriented around the harvesting and consumption of shellfish, um, and massive consumption of shellfish, once you eat those shellfish, the shell from all of those oysters and clams are deposited around your house or around your campsite. The calcium carbonate in that marine shell actually buffers the acidity in our soils here. So whereas if you went out and dug a random hole in your backyard and buried your cat in it, and you went to dig up Fluffy five years later, there wouldn't be much evidence of Fluffy left. If you buried Fluffy in a shell midden, there would be a lot of Fluffy left for a very, very long time. Essentially what happens is where people were living and depositing this marine shell, they've created these time capsules that preserve organic material like bone, like wood. Um, we can even have leather and hide materials. Um, the, the sediments themselves, the midden sediments, can be oily and greasy to the touch and smell like fish or seal grease. Um, because what you're essentially looking at is the soil that was underneath the home where families were living for hundreds if not thousands of years and their cooking fires and all of the tools that they're making. Um, so what you're seeing in this image is underneath the disturbed the disturbed sediments where the construction occurred, we still have these very intact pockets of midden where we have a great deal of uh, cultural context. So, Shchukwing, what does that name mean in Sklalem? Um, there is, back in the day, there were a lot of theories around the name Squim meant something like uh, quiet waters or silent waters or something like that. Um, that was incorrect. In, in the Squalum language, Shchukwing means a good place to hunt or a good place to shoot um, and could be a reference to one of two things. This village was closely associated with the Squim Prairie. Um, where, uh, and I'll talk about this more in the next couple slides, we have archaeological evidence going back for millennia of the Sklalem and their ancestors um, seasonally camping on Squim Prairie and hunting deer and elk intensively, not just for meat, but for hides, for sinews, for bone, for tool usage. Um, every part of the animal was put to use. Um, Shtukwing could also be a reference to Gibson Spit just north of the village site, which was where there were a series of 10 paired duck nets. So each family in the village owned and maintained their own duck nets. And every year when we have our huge seasonal waterfowl migrations in uh, late fall, early winter, you can go out and they would, uh, they would weave these massive nets from nettle twine that would measure 40 feet across and something like 20 feet deep, 30 feet deep, absolutely massive nets. And you would go and you would pull these nets up between two big poles on the spits. And then you, you would send somebody out in a canoe. They would scare the waterfowl up off the water. The ducks fly into the nets. You drop the net and you've got a couple hundred ducks ready for smoking and preserving for winter. Um, so Shtukwing could be a reference to the Squim Prairie, or it could be a reference to duck hunting on the spit, or a reference to both. Shtukwing was just a really good place to hunt or to shoot. Um, a little bit more on the Squim Bypass site, and I don't want to hammer this home too much because we're, we're focusing on the, the village primarily, but there was a trail, and it shows up on the earliest maps of the Squim Dungeness Valley, there is a trail connecting the Shchukwing village site to the, the large Squim Prairie. And then there was another trail that connected that Squim Prairie to the Sporcine Prairie. And these were primarily hunting prairies. These are uh, excessively well-drained gravelly soils as opposed to the prairies that were on the west side of the Dungeness River that have um, 
much better, richer soils that retain water, and that's where the camas gardens would have been located. That's where a lot of the, the more traditional um, agricultural practices would have been centered around those smaller prairies to the west of the Dungeness. The prairies to the east of the Dungeness were more, uh, more in a sense of like a hunting park, um, keeping an open landscape so that you can see where the deer and the elk are on the landscape. You can track them, you can follow them, um, and we have evidence of them intensively hunting that elk herd for at least the last four to four and a half thousand years. Um, and like I said earlier, every piece of that elk was used, um, not just the meat, the bones were used to make tools, the sinews were used as cordage um, and thread, and then the antlers were used also for tools and specifically to make harpoon points and elk antler wedges for splitting red cedar. Um, and so what we have here, this sketch on the left side is one of this uh, archaeologist sketch of one of the pit houses that they found at the Squim Bypass site. Uh, Shukwing was a winter village. So every year, the Squalum people would come back to the winter village sometime around late, late October, early November. And winter was your um, the ceremonial period in life when a lot of the dances and ceremonies would happen. Um, then come this time of year, March, April, May, as things start to warm up, different families would pack up on their canoes and head out to their different fishing sites at the mouths of different streams, out to their different um, clam gathering banks, and then certain families the, who would traditionally hunt every year would pack up and head inland to, for example, this site on the Squim Prairie where they had these, uh, these dugout pit houses that were occupied for 3,000 years probably by the same family and their descendants coming back every single year, not only living in these houses, but within these homes, uh, the different little things that you can see circled are different uh, tool making areas. So there was one area where they specifically made these small quartz microblades. They were used for cutting those elk sinews. There was one area where they made ground slate, uh, ground slate points for knives. There was another area where they were obviously um, harvesting the sinews because there was a pile of metatarsals and metacarpals, which are um, elk and deer foot bones or toe bones, which is what you cut those sinews off of. There was a whole nice pile of those foot bones there in one area next to the fire pit. That's where somebody sat and cut sinew after sinew off to use for later tool use. Um, so just really, really fascinating archeological uh, site here. So this map is showing you those dotted lines are, uh, it's interesting on the GLO maps, they recorded them as roads in the 1850s. There weren't roads in Squim in the 1850s. Those were Indian trails connecting the village sites to the prairie sites. Uh, and then what you see on these maps, the dark orange is sort of the prairie proper. The light orange are those first farming settle, the first farms you can see around the periphery of the prairie again, out in the middle of the Squim Prairie before the irrigation ditches were put in in the 1890s, was too well drained and was essentially dead brown for half of the year, so it, it didn't have much agricultural use for farmers, as opposed to the area around the periphery of the uh, prairies, where you have a little bit of shade, um, you get things to grow a little bit better, especially uh, in the areas near wetlands. So the 1981 excavations, you can see the photo on the top right side of your screen. You can see the trench that they opened up through the archeological site. And uh, the map on the far left side of your screen shows that trench. What they found was, so ideally when you're conducting an archeological excavation, you are doing a very controlled excavation from the top working down through layer through layer through layer and that way you document every single thing you find how deep it is what its context is to other objects um, and then that way if you say get to a certain depth and find a nice fire pit with a nice tool next to it you can get a radiocarbon date from that fire pit and say oh well somebody made this tool probably around the same date as that fire pit Unfortunately, once you use an excavator to pull all of that archeological material out of the ground in a trench and dump it into a giant pile, 
you lose a lot of that archaeological context because that stuff has been pulled out of the ground. So essentially what they did was they used screens to screen through all of these giant back dirt piles. That's what's labeled as BD with the red arrows on that map. They screened through all of those. They collected all of the artifacts out of the screens. And then they, they basically just made some general assumptions on the site based on the materials that they found in those screens. And, it's, and what their conclusion was essentially that um, this village was occupied for at least 600 years um, and that the excavated materials indicate that the site uh, was probably an elk butchering location or belonged to a hunter. The numerous antler wedges and halves testify to considerable woodworking activity. And the reason I wanted to highlight that conclusion is <laughs> that's exactly what we found in every single excavation at this site since then is intensive hunting of elk and harvesting and butchering of elk and utilization of elk. Um, and then that's something that we also see through the historic record um, when Vancouver and Quimper and these European explorers were first sailing into Dungeness Quimbe. The first thing that they report is the Squalum canoes coming out loaded with elk meat. Um, that was one of the primary uh, economic uh, goods from this village site. So I mentioned the village palisade earlier. Here you can see on a very low tide some of those palisade truncheons still visible. Um, this is over in that left corner of the village right next to, there were actually two gates that were essentially um, built fence sections that could be lifted up and moved into place to block that opening. Um, and so during this period of intertribal warfare, the, the small slave village located to the north of the palisaded village was left out in that exposed location so that uh, if there was an attack, that the, the slaves would bear the brunt of that attack. It would give the Squalum and the Palisade villages time to close up their gates, arm themselves, and respond in force. Um, another artifact that I wanted to highlight that you can see in the bottom right corner uh, is a hand maul or a nipple maul. Um, this is an amazing artifact. Uh, we find them at, at a lot of Coach Salish sites, but usually they're broken. Uh, we find them after they would break and then people would discard them. We have this beautiful specimen that's totally intact that was found by Stan Burroughs, a local resident who lived on Washington Harbor just next to the village site. Um, and he actually spotted this when the county was doing road construction um, back in the 1980s or 90s. They were, do they were cleaning out a ditch and he noticed this sticking out of the pile of dirt next to the ditch and grabbed it and donated it to the tribe. Um, and what you would do with this tool is you would take the elk antler tines from the elk that you harvested and you would use a piece of sandstone and you would grind that elk tine down into a wedge and I'll show you a picture of what those look like and you would use this hand maul to drive that antler wedge into a western red cedar tree and western red cedar timber splits straight down the grain so using this hand maul and an elk antler wedge you can split nice straight planks for your longhouse you can carve out your canoe. Um, you can do a, a, one, a, a thousand wonderful things with Western Red Cedar using this tool. Um, these were also used in the processing of elk and deer hides for um, clothing and other materials. So uh, traditionally when men went to war, the, the Squalum men would actually wear a double layered armor made of elk hide, of, of tanned thick tanned elk hide that would have been processed using these hand mauls. Oh, I skipped one there. Um, so going back to that map, the, the green triangles that I've uh, placed on this map are just highlighting some of the important uh, resource uh, harvesting locations for the Skalm of Shtukwing. Um, down here at our tribal campus near uh, the green number five at the south end of Squim Bay, this is an area that the tribal ancestors told Erna Gunther uh, they would, uh, the chief of Wa the Washington Harbor Village, Zalskanum, owned the rights to the fish trap on Jimmy Come Lately Creek, which is right next to the tribe's Seven Cedars Casino here in Blinn. When the chief wasn't harvesting off of that fish trap, then other families would have permission to harvest off of that fish trap. While the men were harvesting salmon out of the fish trap, the women would have, they had a nice big patch uh, 
a prairie patch here in Blinn that they would burn every two or three years to re uh, encourage the regrowth of our trailing Pacific blackberries. And then we also have um, large, massive shell midden deposits here at the head of Squim Bay that are um, squalum shellfish cooking pits that are directly related to the uh, processing of butter clams and Olympia oysters that were formerly um, formerly in huge numbers on Squim Bay, and that's part of the tribe's restoration projects right now is trying to restore those populations of butter clams and Olympia oysters to something like their, their former extent at the head of Squim Bay. Um, and the, the shell midden deposits that we have here in Blinn, we've dated um, back over 1,100 years old. So uh, these, these, these resource harvesting cycles have been going on for millennia and involving generations upon generations of passing these traditions down um, of not, not just knowing where these resources are, but the appropriate ways to harvest them um, and to ensure that they'll be there for future generations to harvest. Um, out on Travis Spit, where the green number six is, uh, we actually go out today uh, with the tribe's traditional food and culture program. We have an access agreement with Battelle and Department of Energy. Um, we go out there and do traditional uh, plant gathering for the traditional foods program. Um, John Cook's grandfather, who is from the Shuheen Village site, would actually go out to Protection Island and harvest seals out there. There was a specific spot where he knew the seals jumped off the rocks into the water, and he would actually make a noose out of cedar limbs and lasso seals and pull them into shore and harvest seals that way, um, which just involves a great, <laughs> a, a, an insane amount of human strength, dexterity, know-how, and knowledge. Um, in terms of shell artifacts, you know, we have a ton of butter clams, some little necks, cockles, sort of a, a little bit of everything that you find in Squim Bay. Um, one, one note is that the archaeologists did not collect or measure sea urchin spines uh, because there were literally so many of them. Within the shell midden itself, our lens is three to four inches thick of sea urchin spines. And what that is evidence of is late winter occupation. So, um, come January, February, early March, when there's not a whole lot of uh, resources available for people, um, sea urchins are relatively easy to catch. They don't run fast. They're very calorie rich. So when we find these very dense sea urchin deposits, that's usually evidence for archaeologists that people were living at this site during late winter periods. And we know that this was a winter village site, so that makes sense. Um, we also have one or two pieces of California mussel. You don't find California mussel um, this far down the Strait of Juan de Fuca. They would have had to uh, paddle out to the West End or trade um, for these shells. And California mussel shells, um, most famously from the Ozette site out on the West End of the Olympic Peninsula, um, were used to create these razor sharp harpoon points. Um, so incredibly important tool, tool source there. Uh, we also had a great deal of historic period artifacts, but it, it really gets hard to discern what would have belonged to the, the historic period Squalum Village versus what would have uh, belonged to the later uh, Buggy Clam Cannery. So I'm not going to get too into that, but, but one interesting thing that we did find um, is we have quite a few beautiful uh, porcelain fragments that are left over from a Japanese immigrant worker community that was also at the Buggy Clam Cannery. Um, sometime right around 1900, 1901. Um, we conducted additional excavations in, in 2019 um, with Department of Energy archaeologists uh, and found some really cool stuff. In the top right corner of your screen, you can see an etched pebble. So this is the first etched pebble that we have found at an archaeological site outside of Chuitsen, the Squalum village site over at um, the base of Edis Hook in Port Angeles Harbor. Um, for those of you who uh, remember when that project occurred, um, they ended up, they, they excavated a Squalum cemetery um, and, and during those excavations they encountered over 300 of these etched pebbles. Um, etched pebbles are a cultural tradition that you find um, archaeologically, you can actually trace it up the west coast from Chuitzen all the way up through to the Alaskan archipelago. 
Um, and so what's interesting to us is we found one in 2019 at another site here on our side of the U.S. border, and it's another Squalum village site. So we have some sort of a, a Squalum cultural connection and the, the, or tradition that connects Chiquing to Chihuitzen to these other village sites going up to Vancouver Island and then all the way up the west coast to Alaska. Um, you can see the photo in the bottom middle, middle here, um, a, a great photo of some intact shell mid in there. So you can see a thick, about four inch thick lens of butter clam shell um, between some lenses of charcoal and carbon. You can see some fish bones sticking out of there. Um, and then there's actually a few historic structures still out there. Uh, the photo on the bottom left side, you can see the old bed frame and uh, walls on this cabin that's sort of getting overgrown by a grove of Nuka Rose. Um, but, but still just really interesting history out there that's uh, because it's Department of Energy and Patel property and protected, uh, these resources are still intact, which is great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up there.